Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. All right, good evening. It's 7 o'clock here in the, on the West Coast. Another warm summer day here in Los Angeles. Looking forward to talking a little bit of wine with you for a moment here at Zoom Into Wine. My name is Ian Blackburn. I'm a wine specialist and teacher, and I've been hosting classes here in Los Angeles for over 20 years. I started to learn about wine in 1995 as a way to teach myself about wine, and I must say I'm, I'm a little bit of a student tonight myself. Uh, this category of Pet Nat or uh, Petulant Natural is uh, something that <clears throat> has really become a little bit more uh, interesting, more developed, and certainly um, more demand has created uh, more products entering into the marketplace. I'm just taking a couple of settings here and adjusting them. Good evening, Lisa. Hope you're doing well. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. <clears throat> Excited about a number of things. This is a big night for Dodger fans. Uh, we're going up against the Trastros, or Astros as they're called, and uh, we got Matt Scherzer pitching for the first time tonight, so it's a pretty big big occasion if you're, if you're a Dodger fan, um, but a really an amazing uh, display of great baseball going on in Los Angeles this evening. That is my giant, so I, I hate to say that. But, you know, I, I heard you say it. I know. <laughs> and yes, they're doing very well. They're doing very well. They're three and a half ahead and uh, the best record in baseball. So it's a really competitive season. It's felt like it's the playoffs since the very first game of the year. So it's quite an interesting development. It's this, there's not a dull moment. It's been very exciting. And the, uh, the trading period was really, really uh, amazing. We'll see how that even takes it up a notch. So let's get into our topicality tonight. We're talking about sparkling wine, and uh, we've got some really fun uh, information for us. Now, I am expecting our guest, Doug, to join us. And if he does not uh, figure out how to get onto the Zoom with me, I will just continue without him until he does up here. But I think that's him coming in right now. Hi, Doug. I can see his audio still being adjusted. <clears throat> I got gotcha. you. How are you? Let me unmute you and uh, give you a little spotlight there. I don't know if it'll show up until I take the slideshow down. There we go. How you doing? You're up in Northern Cal, right? I'm in I'm in Los Alamos, yeah, and I really I really underestimated the uh, the uh, internet out here. Jeez, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> I had to I had to get close to as close as I could to the office. You know? <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Which, yeah. which winery are you then? Uh, I thought you were up in Sonoma, but you're actually in Santa Barbara. I'm in I'm in Los Alamos. I was visiting uh, Scotty Boy today so it's a winery we just picked up uh, a guy named um what's his name scott i mean obviously um, <laughs> <I> hope so <laughs> but he's doing a lot of fun things he's doing a lot of um extended elevage in the natural process so he's he just released some wines that were 2014 I mean, the current release so i'll have to bring them back they're cool stuff all right well cool well doug is our uh noted expert on the natural wine category and he works <clears throat> for a very accomplished book in the category as well so he has a lot of different products that uh, uh, he is really responsible for and we picked a couple of uh, ones that I had been watching for a while and and uh, wines that I had a little bit of experience with so Doug I don't th I don't know if you've had a chance to review the PowerPoint but I'm just gonna take it take you through it we'll start off with uh, donkey and goat <clears throat> And then move in. Great. Into, okay. Great. All right. So, you know, tonight we're talking a little bit about the category. <clears throat> uh, petulant, 
uh, natural is, it's just a word I just stumble saying every single time I go to try to pronounce it. Petulant. Because that's why I guess everybody starts saying pet nat, right? That's why we do pet nat, exactly. It's such a <laughs> mouthful. My God, if you had to spit that out every time you wanted a glass, nobody would ever order one. So yeah. pet nat became the category, but it's really just a natural process. Um, and Doug, you know, what what is the difference between pet nat and say a sparkling wine or champagne? What is the overall difference? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, there's a couple metaphors I could give you. Um, the first one off the bat is just, this is the original traditional way to make sparkling wine. One of the, um, one of the process of when you make wine, when you ferment the grapes uh, with the yeast, the sugars uh, will transfer into alcohol, but as a byproduct, you will get CO2. You will get bubbles as a byproduct. And so if you make a still wine, you release those bubbles. If you want to trap the bubbles in there, you seal it. And traditionally, the uh, original method, as we called it, was method ancestral, or as it's known, method as ancestral, a.k.a. Petillion natural, pet nat, all those are viable terms for the, the primary fermentation that seal the bubbles in the bottle. Uh, totally acceptable. But yeah, that was kind of the, the origin of it. And that's the comparison. Champagne, cava, a lot of the sparkling wines you drink domestically with a cork that have the cage on it would go through a secondary fermentation, which there is a process we can get into. But basically, pet nat is a single fermentation, and you trap the bottles in the bottle, uh, trap the bubbles in the bottle. The other wines that we're normally used to drinking, champagne, cava, uh, domestic sparkling wine, anything that has a cork and a crown on it, or cork and cap, uh, cork and crown, would be uh, go through two fermentations. Yeah, that's basically the difference. Aside from that, the other metaphor I like to give is uh, the pet nat would be the wine drank around the bodega while they got the champenois method ready to sell. So uh, house wine versus selling wine in a very basic way would be a good way to say it. Donkey and goat. Uh, I mm -hmm. first uh, started tasting these wines, I don't know, five or six years ago. I don't know how much uh, longer before uh, I got I got introduced uh, that they they oh it says 2004. Um, how long have you been associated with them? I used to uh, be a buyer at a restaurant in Los Angeles, uh, uh, 2009 2008. And so I started bringing in some donkey and goats. Then I'd been turned on donkey and goat a couple of years after, actually by uh, Amy Atwood. I was a, a server in a restaurant in Los Angeles, and I had seen the wines uh, and got an opportunity to, to taste them, not as a buyer, but as a server. And uh, I kind of just started following from them. And so when they um, became an opportunity for me to buy, I started buying them. And now I have an opportunity to work for them and represent them. So I've worked uh, and, and represented Donkey Go for seven years now in Los Angeles and Southern California. And um, Tracy and, and Jared are, are, in my opinion, some of the original California natural wine producers. They, as you said, 2004, 2005, I think was probably their first marketable vintage that they actually started selling wine out of. And in my mind, they're, they uh, they get the OG mantle, the original gangster mantle for being a natural wine producer here in California. And um, along with a handful of others, of course. Uh, but let's focus on donkey and goat. And, and in that, I think you have a, a timeline to where they will uh, after a decade or so, 15, 16 years of making wines in the natural process, they have mastered the art and they do make very clean, stable, uh, very gratifying California representations of natural wine. I think in a really good way. So uh, if you got the wines from us for the Zoom, uh, we are starting off with, uh, with the, the Pet Nat that, uh, that is sparkling Chardonnay Anderson Valley. Um, I believe the notes are completely compliant here, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, Councilman, Val uh, Councilman Vineyard. Mm -hmm. They have pretty strict criteria. Um, if their children cannot run through a vineyard without bringing on some sort of 
chemical component, they will not involve themselves in working with the vineyard. Hmm. So they're, <laughs> they have some really nice uh, criteria for uh, vineyards they want to work with. They've actually stopped working with vineyards that have gone away from the organic practices. So Consulman will be an organic vineyard that's planted in 1981, as you see here. So the grapes are very mature. The vines have been able to dig down deep in the vines and kind of be a self-sustainable kind of vine process. Um, they've worked with this vineyard, I think, since, since the inception of Lily's uh, Pet Nat, which was the first vintage, I believe, was 2011. So 2021 will be the 10-year the anniversary for the Lily's Pet Nat couple photos to take us through it this is tracy brandt tracy is one half of the donkey and goat team the other half being jared um i i don't want to be biased here but i think tracy's influence on the winemaking process has been monumental and transitioning them into some what of a tra traditional california style into something more fresh bright really clean more acid driven Kind of the wine, if you did have an opportunity to taste the Donkey Goat Lily's Pet Nat, you will find exactly what I'm talking about. The fresh, bright, clean, domesticated flavor profiles that you get in California fruit. But dry. Definitely but dry. But bone dry. Exactly. Oh. But bone dry. Very pleasing. And this is, to the this is yes. basically uh, like stainless steel or I don't know. There, there might be some wood involved too, but uh, uh, I think it's like basically like a sparkling chardonnay i mean or... it's a sparkling chardonnay yeah right yeah blanc, and and i mean it. for lack of better terms we would call it a, a blanc de blanc uh, would be what we would normally refer to it as in the traditional sparkling wine making method um pretty pretty well known in california if you have any uh so um oh man i'm not gonna remember any of these places but uh, carneros makes a sparkling blanc de blanc uh, a lot of napa producers that I've since forgotten uh, will make a sparkling uh, Chardonnay. But Donkey and Goat was one of the originals to just do the single primary fermentation. And with the single primary fermentation, you trap a lot of uh, what the winemakers will call character. You know, you, tr you trap the leaves, you, you do not disgorge it. You do not fine or filter it. You keep a lot of the body and the texture and the weight and so it's one of those things you will get the flavor profile of the Chardonnay along with the with the beautiful part of the sparkling aspect of it. This and here we get into some of the soils here from yeah. the Anderson Valley. Um, these are going to be a very different context than maybe what we're familiar with in the, the Napa and Sonoma. Sonoma being very coastal influenced, Napa being uh, a very um, uh, well, it's a it's a conjunction of soils as we see here, and so Napa is unique in that you get the the riverbed, the volcanic, and very similar to what you see here with the, the Anderson Valley soil. And these are definitely going to uh, contribute to some of the characteristics of the Chardonnay grape. And and one could argue that maybe is there a Chardonnay uh, grape that's better for oak and better for sparkling? You know, this this is a ret rhetorical question you could keep out there, but. There might be some clones or some regions that might uh, behoove a sparkling, more acid-driven wine versus uh, a more uh, body texture, traditional California style. Yeah, and they're very uh, they're very concerned about who they work with. Um, the growers are are paramount in what and how they're able to make their wine. Uh, as I said before, they've They've actually had disagreements with winemakers. They've, uh, or I'm sorry, with wine growers. They've been in. Um, they've worked with since day one. That they've actually come to terms, uh, gotten disagreements, and, and broken up with. Um, which is a crazy thing because if you're a young uh, California winemaker and you have access to fruit, it's really a difficult thing to give that fruit up. It's, it's fruit is a is a rare commodity in the state. Um, they will oftentimes use multiple vessels. Uh, when they age their wine, I believe in the Lily's Pet Nat is is uh, it's purely stainless steel, but they will split wines up into neutral barrel, into neutral fudra, and it's stainless steel, and they will blend together to to blend those attributes you gain from each of those vessels. So, what I'm trying to understand is, 
if it's a primary fermentation that's taking place in the bottle, is there time in the wood before it's transferred over? Is it, uh, is it mostly through fermentation and then it's put in the bottle or is it go the whole way? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways to make pet mat. And uh, one ideally is, is uh, you would begin the process as you would any type of wine, white or red, probably in a neutral vessel, usually a stainless steel to begin the primary fermentation. And then even with reds and whites, you will transition, you will transfer that wine into a neutral barrel or a larger aging vessel that's appropriate for extended elevage. I believe in the Lily's Pet Nat case, they just did the stainless steel. With the Pet Nat, there's, there's a couple ways to, to make it. Like I said, temperature is paramount in this process. And in the past, the method ancestral, you would just kind of go with the way the seasons gave you. And at that time, usually these regions had huge diurnal shifts in temperature. So you would have hot, hot days and cold, cold nights. And in places like Loire, and Lemieux, where these wines kind of stem from, you had these really, really cool, cool temperatures that slowed fermentation down, probably to the point where if you're talking method industrial, you're talking thousands of years ago, it was probable that the winemaker probably perceived this wine to be finished. You know, they probably thought this wine was a finished product. They put it in the bottle and then lo and behold, when they open it, it turns out there's bubbles in there because either temperature or light or something's going to reactivate those dormant sugars to reactivate the fermentation process. And you're going to trap those CO2 bubbles in the bottle. And that's likely how it began. Uh, I believe Donkey and Goat still adheres to that process. We'll get to Duckman, who I know adheres to that process. So what they'll do is they'll keep that wine in the, in the tank. They will drop the temperature down so low to where it doesn't necessarily freeze, but it will slow the fermentation process or halt the fermentation process to where they almost just keep it in uh, limbo. And then once they go in the bottle, uh, whether you enact it with light or shake it up a little, or it's gonna have some bubbles in there just by the natural process of making that wine. So yeah, the primary, there's a couple ways you're gonna put it into a, a steel vat it's possible it could go into into neutral barrel. And then there's another process, aside from just the temperature control, there's some places that will actually freeze the must. So they'll freeze the, the bottom of the kind of component of the, of the wine that is the initial. So the grapes and seeds and stems with some liquid, they'll freeze that. And if they do go to barrel, like you said, if they do want to have some more texture or more body or more aging process, it's likely the fermentation process will tap out and you won't be able to go in a bottle and keep it a pet nat. And so what they'll do to still keep it a pet nat is go ahead and have that go in a bottle, re-add the must. I'm sorry, they'll re-add the must, the frozen must. That'll reactivate some bubbles. It'll get some CO2 and then they'll bottle it right then. That way you keep the, the bubbles in there. But, but just a side note, just one easy telltale sign to see a pet nat versus a traditional sparkling line is the pet nat will have a crown cap. It'll look like a beer bottle cap. So you'll have a beer bottle cap. Exactly. Yeah. This is indicative of a pet nat or a single fermentation process. Uh, when you see the cork in the crown, that's secondary more often than not. And not always true. You're always going to see one or two, but for the most part, you can rely on that rule. It should work out. Well, another question I'm going to have. Okay. So primary fermentation comes to an end. You got some bubbles. But then yeah. what about malolactic? What happens? Yeah, uh, I mean, malolactic is a natural process in the winemaking. And so oftentimes I think that's the, there's the, therein lies the winemaking choice, in my opinion. If you halt the fermentation early by temperature control, by dropping that temperature, you're probably gonna also halt the malolactic fermentation. You're gonna halt that transition from the malic acids into the lactic acids, from the zippy crisp acids into the more voluptuous mouthfeel acids. And that's probably where you're gonna use a must. That's probably where we're gonna use some neutral barrel. 
in the case of Donkey and Goat, I think it was purely stainless steel. And I think if you can look at the alcohol percentage on the bottle of the Donkey and Goat, I believe it's fairly low. And alcohol percentage will, will in, especially in context of Chardonnay, especially in context of sparkling Chardonnay, it should reveal whether or not it went through mallow or not. And so if you have a lower alcohol, you probably didn't go through mallow. You probably kept the acid. If you have a higher alcohol, 13%, you probably did. Hmm. And though, and if you go through mallow, Ian, I think that is where you will implement the must. You will implement some sort of sugar, tirage, dosage aspect. Um, which, you know, then you get an argument as a pet matter or, or a champagne method. But mm -hmm. most people will, will stick with the pet nap method because it's only a single primary fermentation. Yeah. Yeah, this says 11.2 uh, alcohol. So, um, uh, <clears throat> conceivably, uh, acids could be in a place where uh, malolactic is uh, minimized. Uh, yeah, it could it could begin, but it could also halt it just based on that temperature. Yeah, and not to say malolactic necessarily refers to a higher alcohol, but if you go through the full process of making those wines and getting those wines to go through mallow, often than not, they will tap out at a higher alcohol. But because Dunkin' Goat wanted to embrace the acid of Chardonnay, embrace that freshness, also maintaining a small amount of residual sugar in the in the grape. And, and, and again, I don't want to use that sugar in a bad way. It's a very small amount that you could contrast with the acidity of the bubbles it's likely that malolactic was halted for sure to keep that acid and keep the freshness and to keep some sugar intact and to keep some of that Sunday morning beautiful brightness, which is which is why I like to drink it on Sunday morning. Just, that's all. Who's this gentleman? This is Jared, and Jared is the other half of Donkey Goat. Jared is uh, Jared Brandt. He has been making wine with Tracy for uh, ever since the inception. They have an amazing story in that they actually were able to knock on the door of Eric Texier in the Northern Rhone and actually have it be answered. And so a lot of their references are to the Eric Texier style of making wine. And for those who don't know, Eric Texier is probably one of the most prominent natural wine producers out of the Northern Rhone. Um, Anybody that was able to say they have a, a, a lineage of education from them is doing quite well. Um, all right, document, yeah. Yeah, so we we um, <clears throat> pause for a second here and just uh, acknowledge that uh, I'm actually not not drinking right now, so I'm not gonna taste this <laughs> with us, but um, I am, uh, I uh, have tried uh, this wine in the past with you, in fact, Doug. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I would say is that this, this I, I have also had uh, experience with the brand in previous years and decided that I wanted to get involved in this, this idea, this pet nat category with, the, with our Merchant of Wine store. And um, so when you're going into the category, you look for the leaders. Um, yeah. I tasted the wine and uh, was very convinced that uh, people that buy it from us would be very uh, pleased. It is a, 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 a fuller, richer, brighter, crisper uh, smack your palate with a lot of yeah. intensity, um, uh, freshness. It is a 2020. This wine is kind of rewarding uh, the idea of drinking it in its youth and yeah. um, seeing seeing the fresher side of wine. And there's a lot of people that are being drawn to this because of the lack of preservatives, the, mm -hmm. the very natural path method. There's nothing added to make this wine. It's a very natural experience. And I remember being up in San Francisco about 10 years ago and walking into a restaurant that was selling wine that was still fermenting. They were selling it in yeah. little urns on the table from a, from a keg that they got at the winery. And it was like Sauvignon Blanc that was just like, you know, 
moving. It was still moving. Taste, taste the living wine. You get to taste living wine. Yeah. yeah. And so <clears throat> there's different phases of that. Um, and, and, you know, transporting that could be a little difficult, a little volatile. Um, yeah. We even learned that even these guys can be a little volatile. Um, yeah, we had a lesson in that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, these guys are, you know, uh, Donkey and Goat is a brand to definitely, if you're going to experiment for the first time, I would recommend it because I do believe there's a, a likability and a, a broad broadness to the wine that will, will draw you in and you will see the innate qualities in tasting this wine. Other natural wines that I've tried, uh, they are a little more risk-taking, a little less experienced, um, possibly um, just quite honestly don't have the wisdom that these guys have. So. I agree with you. And I think that's a paramount thing. It's, it's my experience has been, especially the domestic winemakers. Is once you start seeing some of the, the winemakers that are focused on natural wine, get it into year five, year six, year seven, you start seeing more stability. You start seeing, you really do start seeing the artists figure out their craft. And it's something that I love about my job. I've been doing this long enough to where I've been able to witness a handful of winemakers here domestically kind of figure it out. But I, I agree with you, full boat. I think it, just in context of, of uh, Donkey Goat versus Duckman, is Donkey and Goat started from scratch. You know, these were these were 10 years ago, 2004. They started. They knew nothing. And now you're talking about Maria Pato, the son or the daughter of Luis Pato the son of uh, Joe Pato, one of the, you know, we might as well call him the Mandavi of Portugal. I mean, these names are synonymous with, with huge brands that have been legacies with Portugal. So now you have, uh, you have a legacy winemaker. You have a, a winemaker that has uh, heritage and how to make wine from her family, generational, and yet she chose to embrace the properties of the land and the grape and not necessarily the the winemaking process um well, i mean gonna, i don't know how to be honest i i had no idea of the history of the brand yeah but yeah. i was i was super attracted and this is not something i would do very often doug i'm being very uh, open and honest here but i saw the packaging and i'm like that is so cool and yeah. and I just said, I, let me find out more about it. So uh, after yeah, I found good. out who made the duck, duck man, which has, literally has a duck on the label, and it is uh, artfully done, um, I went in and did some research. Found out that you carried the wine, and that's what yeah. put us together in the first place. And uh, perfect. I don't I, I don't know where the name duck man came from. Is it just because of the artwork? Well, I mean, Pato, the, the last name Pato is Spanish for duck. And oh, there you go. I think, I think uh, her grandfather, Joe Pato, um, I mean, really, we are talking one of the pioneers of modern day Portugal, Portuguese wine. That's and it. I've always, always been enamored with Portugal from the historical context of wine because Portugal has always been isolated from the rest of Europe. And there's a lot of reasons to it. I would highly encourage any of your uh, your your uh, customers that are historically inclined towards wanting to know about wine from the historic historical perspective to look at the relationship between Portugal and wine. It's fascinating because you have varietals there that never left. You have varietals there that have been auto autochronous that have never been grafted that are uh, you know fully oh, pre phylloxera. Really? Yeah, you have a lot of history there that. That does not participate in the whole history of wine. Um, I know the reasons. I think it's utterly fascinating. I would encourage your 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 customers to look into it too. I think it's endlessly fascinating. But there is a wonderful. I mean, you know, a lot of these grapes we talk about in Portugal and a lot of these regions we just don't have a ton of. But yeah, most of the regions are here in the north of Portugal, and what we would call the the you know probably more prominently be familiar with the south uh, southwest part of Spain. But in northern Portugal, I mean, honestly, these wines have only really come into our presence in the modern day wine culture in the last couple of decades. They really haven't been around as long or as 
resonate as much as Italian or French or even, you know, Spain. Um, so I think this is a really untapped region. I think it's difficult, though, because we don't know a lot of the bridal. Um, furthermore, you're only having a recent push towards the natural uh, or, or traditional style of making wine. So Duckman is at the forefront. Maria Pato is at the forefront of this movement in Portugal. And like you said, yes, that rosé is absolutely gorgeous. And I think a lot of people might look at that and I don't know who would look at that and not want to drink it. I have no idea who would not want to drink that just based upon appearance. Right. You know? And that's one of the things a lot of my winemakers used to say, you drink with your eyes first. And I think this is a wonderful representation of that. Good point. Um, yeah, for now, Paris, um, Baga, I mean, this is this is a thing. These are indigenous varietals to the region of Portugal. And they have not left. There's maybe a few graftings here in California, if you, if any, and those are probably uh, not for Nayo Paris. Um, you may also know this name as Maria Gomez, but again, I, I encourage your people not to worry about these grapes. But really, what this bottle is representing is just a, a style and a feeling that, quite frankly, it's not purposefully going against aged wine and champagne and wine that is supposed to go to cellar and see time these are simply the wines that were just meant to be drank around while you were waiting for those wines to get ready and yeah you see the small production you see how small it is i mean eight thousand bottles i mean that's 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 seven hundred and that's, 700, 50, that's less than 70, 700 cases. Seven, that's less than that's 700, 700 cases. cases. Yeah, and that's for the world. That's for the whole world. That's not just the U.S. That's the whole world. Um, so that's New York. That's Tokyo. That's that's London. That's Paris. That's all the places. So I'm glad we got you some. I'm very glad. Yeah, we got no, you I, and uh, I've been happy to have it. Um, I'm, you know, certainly, you know, novice in the category of of pet nat but uh definitely wanted to have something cool to for the cool kids and yeah yeah yeah. these are these are cool ones yeah oh there you go wow look at that yeah so obviously when you bottle this stuff this is what they're doing here's a great this is a great picture Ian. this is a great picture so what you're looking at is a completely cloudy version of wine and if you've ever visited a winery if you've ever done a barrel tasting if you've ever tasted wine it's not even close to being ready. This is what it looks like. This is this is all the leaves. This is all the minuscule, microscopic uh, pieces of skin and 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 leaves and and solubles that most process will find and filter. They will take out, so you get a beautiful, visually pleasing wine. Um, this was the way wine always looked. It wasn't, it was only in modern history that we started clarifying wine for the, for exactly what we're talking about, to, to drink it with our eyes first. But now we're at a point where this, exactly what you're looking at now, when they bottled it, by the time they put it in the box, all of that stuff will settle. And I don't have one in front of me, but if you, if you have the bottle that has little accumulation of solubles in the bottom of the bottle, there, there are might some, get that. You might of, get a few. Yeah, I think there's actually more in the donkey and goat. Definitely more in the donkey and goat. Yeah, which is funny because I know I said they probably didn't disgorge, but they do disgorge that donkey and goat too, and then they top it off. But all of these, all of this cloudiness, by the time it gets to us in LA, will all have settled at the bottom of the bo bottom of the bottle, <laughs> and. You know, traditionally, this was a very off-putting thing. But I think of recent times, people have recognized having some leaves or some of those solubles or tartrates in the bottom of the bottle. These equate to flavor. This, if you're somebody that's focused on health, this is a wonderful thing to look at because it means the wine was not manipulated or fined or filtered. So, yeah. And so these, exactly that, these are minimal intervention wines. And so they really are trying to focus on the wine. I and mean, I think a lot of times these words get thrown out, minimal intervention. What does that mean? And what does that mean? 
compared to like a regular champagne. And as we said earlier, just minimal intervention. I mean, I really want you to view these wines as the wines that the winemakers drank while they were making the really, you know, beautiful wines for, to sell. And Ruiz de Barrio, oh man, good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Ruiz de Barrio, Barro? <laughs> I won't, uh, I won't but anyway. to speak Portuguese, but... Um, yeah, no Portuguese, but yeah, I mean, just based upon the location of these vineyards, I'm hoping you should pick up some salinity from the Atlantic Ocean, because these are pretty adjacent to the Atlantic, and you should get some really nice salty notes to those. Let's let's check out this video here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Let's see how, uh, how we do. This is about five minutes, so we'll probably cut it short. And this, so can you tell me about yeah, that's Maria. The, the soils, the climate, what's typical of the region? Okay, we have uh, the clay and we have uh, the limestones. On the limestones you can find those fossils, the shells, or you can find the ammonite fossils that are more important. That says that the the formation of this soil was from Jurassic era. Mm -hmm. yeah. Regarding the... I mean, whenever you see that white, calcareous, chalky soil, I just, just think acid. That's what I do. I just think that that's yeah. going to give these wines a great acid. A big difference of temperature between the day and the night. During the day, the temperature is can be around 30 degrees. During the night, the temperature is more or less the same as in the water uh, in the ocean that is 20 kilometers far from here. And you know what is the temperature in the ocean here? 16 degrees. <laughs> yes, it's really, really cold. If you That's go there, big you'll understand. Iron shift. And that, it's hard to swim, but it's very nice for us because it keeps really the freshness that is a real signature of Bairrada wines. Mm -hmm. I forgot to tell why chalky clay is so important in Bairrada, because it gives the structure to the wine, the smokiness, the fullness, that it's very enriching the wines. Mm -hmm. Super. Mm -hmm. Your father, when he started making wines here, he particularly looked for this soil for reds, why and for bagger in particular how does it impact the character of the bagger grape uh, i think in the beginning it was not a matter of choosing it was a matter of having the red grapes here in shocky clay soil okay and there's one interesting thing when it started first it was in 80s when he went to london for the first taste first tasting of his wines uh, in 84, people mm. was asking him if the wine had some wood. At that time, there was not possible to have wood. It was all cement. But, and uh, we think that people was ask, were asking that because of this, the, the, this soil. Because this soil gives the sensation of smokiness that uh, sometimes can uh, be filled as uh, having sm uh, wood. Toast. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And then my last question mm -hmm. is about this vintage, 2017, because now all the leaves are changing, you've finished your harvest. Has it been an earlier vintage? What's the character of the... I'll stop it there. But um, really cool to uh, get to see the, yeah. face, the, had the voice of the, of the winemaker. Advance here. Yeah, that's cool, Maria. I believe that's our last slide. That's why. All right. Well, we. Oh, okay. uh, I. What What would you uh, lean into in telling people what to expect in tasting this duck man? Because this is not something we got to taste. Why? Because did you see that number? Seven hundred cases for the world. This is like. Tiny. Teeny, teeny producer. I got one case allocated. That's it. And uh, so uh, 
There you go. Oh, good job, Ian. <laughs> yeah. So the but the, uh, the 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 Portuguese varieties, uh, that mm -hmm. smoky soil. Um, you know, have have you tried this wine, and what would you? Uh, how would you describe it? I have. I'm. Uh, I'm actually super guilty. I'm not really somebody that anoints a certain type of wine that I'm favorable to. But I must admit that I definitely lean towards pet nats. And I lean towards Portuguese pet nats in particular because there is a great, great salty component to these wines. Uh, I think it really, as, as the video said, Maria kind of was talking about the terroir and its influence on these grapes in particular. But I think, you know, the salty strawberry context is, is very real with this. And it's nothing I would ever think to just have on its own. I would never ever think to put salt on a strawberry and eat it and be like, oh, that's delicious. However, that, that, that wine just puts that phrase into my mind and it's truly a fantastic wine. It is qualified as bone dry. There were no measured residual sugars left in this wine. So it is a, a dry sparkling wine. I, I think I think these wines are for people of a, that are looking for something adventurous and fun. You know, I always, I worked in the restaurant industry for a good 20 years and I recognized that there were, there's many types of customers, but there's two types in general. There's the type, and both are wonderful. Both are wonderful, best guests. There's the type that will come in with his wife and he's been in there for 40 years and he will get the same pork chop and the same glass of wine and the same style and that man will be so happy every single time he comes in because he's in his place and he's you know and, and same for his wife his wife will get the same piece of fish and the same glass of wine and they were so happy and they loved it on the flip side i had another couple that would come in and never want to look at the menu and always ask me we want three courses we want three wines take care of us and, and I love that. And I would see both of these people walk out just happy on each level. And so you can't really judge a, a person who's drinking or, or eating anything. You can't tell them anything. You can only try to share with them your best. But on both of those occasions, I would try the wine on both of them. And even the one that came in and she wanted her white Blanc de Blanc but I would try her on this and she liked it, but she would order her Blanc de Blanc. And I would try this on a couple that wanted something new and they loved it, but they would never go back to it. But this is a wine for somebody that wants adventure, that wants something new, that wants something fresh, that wants something unexpected. And I think also there's a high context of this and the, and the reality of it, just like, it's a good barbecue wine. It's a good porch wine. It's a good food wine because you have acid and you do have a little body. So I think there's a lot of duality to it. I mean, basically just said everyone so i'm not too much help but especially in this warm weather like this this is a super refreshing and, yeah uh, and absolutely the the wine of the moment right now would be to have it on a nice hot summer evening sunset and yep. getting ready for your evening on the couch watching movies or or uh, inviting friends over whatever it is but this is just super fun I think the packaging is really eye-catching. People will yeah. absolutely love to get this as a gift too. And it's I think this is definitely a bottle if you want to show up to a barbecue or a party with. This is this is going to be a good one for sure, yeah. for sure. And you'll you'll want to you'll want to pocket some of the tasting notes off the website and uh, the information that we got we gained here tonight because people are going to have some questions, right? But uh, just know that it's Portuguese, natural, sparkling. And, yeah, uh, it's very hip right now, and this is like one of the best producers. Those are those are the high points, and then you can get into the nitty gritty, if, especially if you speak a little Portuguese. Start throwing that around. Um, sure, like a tracha, <laughs> <laughs> That's this restaurant where I'm behind you right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I really appreciate you uh, talking to us about. Wines, Doug. Um, these these are really exciting. I'm I'm happy to be getting my feet wet in this category, and uh, we're gonna do uh, another wine from Donkey. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. We're gonna do uh, another wine from Donkey and Goat later this month in our top red wine values, 
and so you'll be able to find that there. Thank you so much, man. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, and thank you for supporting these wines. I hope your I hope your people enjoy them, and then uh, and please let me know if I can help out in any other way. Appreciate it. My pleasure. We'll be, we'll uh, do a little commercial now, guys. Is uh, we've got just a couple of things to let you know about, and so let me take that back and show you. And by the way, Lisa is on the Zoom, and she just picked up a couple of bottles. Thanks, Lisa. I'm glad you are willing to try that. You're exactly who I thought would try the wine. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. And uh, let's see. <clears throat> I just want to show you the uh, Zoom into Wine website, which we continue to build out. Um, our Wednesday tastings going forward in August. We'll take a little summer light as uh, everyone else got lots to do right now. Uh, so we're just focusing on Wednesdays. We're doing a next Wednesday is our rosé, kind of a, the new rosés that just arrived. Some of these were due a couple of months ago, but as everything is being held up in customs and border and containers, everything's delayed. A lot of the great rosés have just walked in the door. So we're going to start uh, with a, a, a really fun set next next week, being able to taste those. Then we've got the uh, top values in red, and this is where I put uh, the donkey and goat um, gallivanter. Um, oh, great. I, I love this wine, dude. This wine is just delicious. And what we do is we break these out. We couldn't do this with the sparkling, but we break the uh, red wines out into small two-ounce pours. So you could buy the tasting kit for 20 bucks and join us on the zoom or the bottle kit for 60 and i've got uh, the donkey goats rep, uh, representing california i got this fantastic new cote de Rhone that's my wine of the week Great. i've got uh, a wine from chile and a wine from spain and so we'll have a nice little value session and that's coming down the pipe and uh that uh, that's how we're going forward. We're breaking them out and keeping the, the zooms very affordable. There's a huge problem right now with Sancerre. And so we'll be talking about Sancerre maybe for the last time in about two years, because probably by the end of this year, everything in Sancerre is gonna be sold out. There is no 2021 vintage coming in Sancerre. It got destroyed by hail and uh, it's gone. So not only do we have container shortages, huge demand, but Sancerre has no 2021 vintage. And so, and these are the 2020s that are coming in and, and, uh, wow. they're all going to be short. A lot of upward pr pricing pressure as well. We're planning our, uh, big stars events coming out into the future. You'll see them here. We're, we're a partner with the LA Magazine at the food event 2021 coming up in late October. And uh, our trip to Italy, those that have signed up to join us, uh, we sent out the uh, big agreements today to get everybody the early bird pricing on this trip. Uh, we are uh, right now still like daily conversations, making sure everything's good to go. Uh, we're working on some insurance product to be able to recommend people to pick up so we don't have any problems. But um, it's really going to be an awesome uh, experience in Italy. And if you've never been to Piedmont or you've never been to uh, Tuscany, we take 10 people to Piedmont and six people to Tuscany. So it's a really uh, intimate wow. experience. Italy and some of these experiences you need to have a couple more people to get the winery to do something special for you and you don't want too many people so that you can't go and see the greatest wineries and that's what we're focused on there so we really uh, enjoy showing people the best there we've been to both Tuscany and Piedmont many many times and this is kind of like a, a greatest hits edition because hey it's 2021 no one's gone anywhere so we want to do something awesome and uh, there's no place that can deliver the value of a trip like Italy. If we went to France and we went to Champagne or Bordeaux or Burgundy, the trip would have another digit in front of it. It's, it's a much different financial equation. And so Italy really represents great value and we'll pass it along. Well, we thank everybody for joining us tonight at Zoom Into Wine. 
We will hope to see you next Wednesday. And thanks for being here. Have a good week, everybody. And go Dodgers. <laughs> go Giants. Uh -huh. Go Giants. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. All right. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.